Well, good morning. My name is Chandler Jackson, in case any of you don't know who I am. And usually they have me uh, back there playing on the drums, but instead they decided to let me speak today, which is uh, kind of scary. But, but to start off today, some of the most remarkable people that I have ever met and some of the most remarkable people that you have ever met can be described this way. They are believe in spite of people. You know people like this, and, and the people I'm talking about are people who go through tremendous hardship in their life. They're facing financial troubles, health troubles, family troubles, all kinds of troubles in their life. But their confidence in God is unshakable. They have a joy and a peace that is just inspiring. It's a peace that Paul would describe as surpassing all human understanding. Some of these people are the reason that you are a Christian in this room for some of you. And for some of you, these people are the reason you're considering becoming a Christian. And this was the case for Dr. Francis Collins. He met one of these people when he was making his rounds during med school. And Dr. Francis Collins may sound like a familiar name to you. And if you remember from school, it's because Dr. Francis Collins was the director of the Human Genome Project. It was a big deal. He was, he was the director of the Human Genome Project. And these people were, were tasked with mapping the entirety of the human genome. If you remember from school, it was a big deal because it was a major breakthrough for medicine. So Dr. Francis Collins is a, is a pretty bright guy. But when he was 27 years old and he was doing his rounds during his internship in North Carolina, he kept bumping into Christians, mostly because of where he was at geographically. North Carolina, there's plenty of Christians. He kept bumping into them. And these people were sick and they were dying. Some of them had diseases where there, there, there may be a cure and they may eventually fight through it. Some of them had diseases that there was no cure for. Their time was limited. They had no hope for a long life. And yet, these people held on to their faith. He would have conversation after conversation with all these people where they would talk about heaven. And they would talk about being reunited with family members. And their faith seemed unshakable. And this was unusual for Dr. Francis Collins because he grew up in a household with parents that were essentially agnostic. So it was, it was, not, it was not usual for him to come in contact with people that were like this. In fact, in his book, The Language of God, he says it this way. He says, if faith was a psychological crutch, it must be a very powerful one. If it were nothing more than a veneer of cultural tradition, and in other words, what he's saying here is if, if this is just something that Southern people do, if this is just something that uneducated people do to get through life, if that's the case, why are these people not shaking their fist at God and demanding their friends and family stop all this talk about a loving and benevolent supernatural power? I mean, these people are dying and their prayers aren't being answered, but they remain faithful. And this was so unnerving to him. And one day he walks into one of his patient's room. It's a patient that he's had for a while. She knows him and he knows her very well. He knows her situation. She's going to die. Her days are limited. She knows it too. But she's talked with Dr. Collins about her faith. And on this particular day, she says, she says Dr., you know, you know my story. You know my faith. I've, I've told you what I believe. And she says, Dr., what do you believe? She says, Doctor, what do you believe? And he said, the, the question kind of caught him off guard. And he sort of stammered out a, an answer. And he said, well, I, I'm not really, really sure what I believe. But he would go on to write about this interaction. And he would say that when I was faced with my willful blindness, willful blindness, meaning, meaning I don't know 
but I haven't really asked the question. There may be something more, but, but I haven't really explored it. I haven't seen, but I'm, I'm not really looking. He said, when I was faced with my willful blindness and my arrogance, I began a journey. And at the end of that journey, Dr. Collins found more than enough evidence for him to place his faith in Christ. He, when he stopped and looked, he figured out that there was more evidence than he ever thought there was. And the thing is, Jesus predicted this, and his disciple John decided to help. Jesus predicted it, and John helped. Jesus said, I'm going to make sure that I do enough that I am seen enough that people can believe in me without a doubt. And John said, I'm going to make sure that everybody knows what I know, that they see what I've seen, that they hear exactly what I heard through my own words. In fact, this is how, this is how John would say it. He would say, that which was from the beginning which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at, which we have looked at with our hands and have touched. This we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared. We have seen it and testify to it. We proclaim to you that we, what we have seen and heard so that you may also have fellowship with Christ. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Because, and the reason he, he would say it this way is because Christianity, at the end of the day, Christianity is not about just believing or taking it by faith. It's not about just believing or just taking it by faith. And you've probably heard these, these, these said before, like, you, you just gotta believe, brother. You're facing something you don't understand. You just got to believe. Or you're going through some troubles and you don't know why. You just got to take it by faith. John and Peter and James and Bartholomew did not follow Jesus because of faith. And John would caution you and he would caution me. He would caution all of us to not follow Jesus just because of faith. They followed Jesus because of what they had seen and what they had heard. And here's the most important thing, perhaps the most important thing. John is not content with just telling us what happened. John has an agenda. John wants something to happen to you and to happen to us that happened to him based on his interaction with the Son of God. In fact, he would, he would lay out his mission statement at the end of his gospel. He said, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. This book meaning the gospel of John, not the Bible. That's what he's referring to. Not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. And throughout his gospel, he would refer to this life as eternal life. And for many of you and for John, you know that eternal life is not something that starts when you die. It's not something that begins after you die. It starts the moment that you believe and place your faith in Jesus Christ. Because when you live this life with the assumption that there is something after this life, you live this life in a very different way. And so today we're going to be looking at some of these, one of these signs that had John would put it. And we're going to start in John chapter 4, verse, four, verse 46. And if you have your Bibles with you, you'll see some kind of heading that says something along the lines of the healing of the nobleman's son. And that's what we're looking at today. So we begin reading. It says, once more he visited Cana in Galilee, where he had turned the water into wine. And for those of you that know the story, some of you may not, 
Jesus and his disciples and his mother are at this wedding, and the wedding runs out of wine. And it's going to be a big taboo subject that there was no wine at the wedding for the guest. And so Jesus' mother approaches Jesus and she says, Jesus, there's no wine and you need to save this wedding. And Jesus looks at his mother and he says, I I didn't come to save weddings, I came to save the world. And she sort of chuckles at him. She says, Jesus, I need you to save the wedding. And like a good boy, he does what his mom told him to do. And Jesus turns the water into wine. This is the town where that happened. And we keep reading, it says, and there was a certain royal official whose son lay sick at Capernaum. And now there's, there are two things that we need to point out here before we, we move any further. The first thing is, is that Capernaum is an eight hour walk from Cana. It takes eight hours to walk from Caperna, Capernaum to Cana. Or, or it takes two to three hours if you have a horse or a chariot to make that journey. The second thing is that we're talking about a royal official, which means that this was a Jewish aristocrat, which, mean he was, which means he was wealthy, which means this wasn't an eight-hour walk from Capernaum to Cana. It was a two- to three-hour ride on a chariot or on a horse. And because he was a Jewish aristocrat, that means more than likely, more than likely, he was a Sadducee. Now, in the Jewish world, there are two important groups. There's the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Pharisees are very religious. They uphold the law meticulously. It is at the center of their being. It is their whole identity is upholding the law. And they believed that God was involved in the details of life. The Sadducees, on the other hand, were very different. They were very intellectual and deterministic. They didn't believe that God was involved in the details of life. They believed that we were basically here for the entertainment of God and nothing more. That everything that was going to happen to you was already predetermined. Your health, your wealth, your family, your social status, everything about your life was already determined. And you didn't really pray to God for anything because whatever was going to happen was just going to happen. Fate dictated everything for these people. But today, for this Sadducee, for this nobleman, all of that goes out the window. Because today, he is a desperate father. Isn't it interesting how all of our intellect and all of our pride and all of our confidence just sort of gets pushed to the side when someone that we love is suffering. And today, this man is a desperate father who is scared to death that his son is going to die. So we continue reading. It says, when this man heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea, He went to him and he begged him to come and heal his son who was close to death. And the verbiage that's used here is is meant to, to, to sort of insinuate that he is pleading with Jesus. He is prostrating himself in front of Jesus. He's saying, please, 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 over and over and over again. He's begging Jesus to come back with him. Pride thrown aside. All of his theology doesn't matter. His social status doesn't matter. His son is sick. And if he can do whatever he could possibly do to get this man to come to his bedside so that he could possibly live, he's going to do it. And what Jesus says to him next seems a bit harsh, but it's it's only harsh, it only sounds harsh because of our English translation. Because Jesus isn't just addressing the nobleman here, he's talking to an entire crowd of people because at this point in Jesus' ministry, He can't go anywhere without having a crowd of people following him so they can see and hear the things that Jesus is going to do and say. And so he addresses the crowd. He says, unless you people see signs and wonders, Jesus told them, you will never believe. And Jesus is just pointing out a simple fact here. Seeing is believing. He knows that these people are not going to buy into the things that he says about himself unless he proves it to them. And Jesus understands this. He's not asking anybody to just believe him. 
And he's not asking anybody to just take it in faith that he is who he says he is. He's, he is going to show these people exactly who he is. And he decides, if I'm, going to, if I'm going to give these people something to talk about, I'm going to make sure that it's so wonderful that people talk about it for the next 2,000 years. And so the nobleman, hear, hearing Jesus address the crowd this way, he sort of leans in and he says, Sir, come down before my child dies. Come down before my child dies. He is so desperate. He's so desperate, but when you read it for yourself and you read all of it in the full context, at the same time, he's, he's so desperate, but at the same time, he is so confident. He is so convinced that if he could just get Jesus to come back with him, that his son would be okay. Why? Why is he so convinced that Jesus could help this situation? Why did he risk leaving his dying son, potentially missing his death, his final moments, to come and beg Jesus to come back with him to save his son? Why? The answer is, is simple. Rumors. Stories. Testimony from other people who had seen and heard the things that Jesus could do. And in his mind, he has two options. Either Jesus comes with me and perhaps my son lives or he doesn't and my son dies. But I could imagine Jesus in this moment putting a smile on his face because, because Jesus knows that there's a third option. And Jesus goes on to ask this man to do what Jesus has been asking people to do ever since. He asked this man to trust him based on the stories from other people. He asked this man to entrust his dying child to him based on the rumors and the testimony of other people. So Jesus turns to the nobleman and he says, go, your son will live. And the Greek here, if you were to really dig into the Greek of this text, it sort of carries this implication that Jesus is saying, just go on about your day. Just go on and don't hurry and don't worry. Your son will live. Dad's in the room. Could, could you imagine? Could you imagine your child is on the verge of death? And the one person that you are convinced can save your child looks at you and says, just go on about your day. Don't hurry and don't worry. They'll live. And you're just expected to trust this person? And this is where we live. This story is so incredibly Brilliant, because this is not just a random act of kindness that Jesus is deciding to do for this person. This is Jesus laying down a path that men and women will walk down for the next 2,000 years. It's a path that some of you have already walked down. And it's a path that some of you are currently walking down. It's a path that some of you will eventually walk down. This story is a lifetime reduced to a day. It's your lifetime and it's my lifetime reduced to a day. We are asked to take Jesus at his word based on the word of other people. We are asked to entrust our life to Jesus, our finances to Jesus, our health to Jesus, our children to Jesus. Everything about us, we are asked to entrust to Jesus based on the testimony of other people. And we are asked to go through this life with our unanswered prayers, confident that there is something to this man, that he is who he said he was. 
And for some of you in this room, you have unanswered prayers. You're walking through life with unanswered prayers and you have that thing that God just won't seem to do for you. But, but even though he won't do that for you, you still continue to serve and you still continue to give and you still continue to listen and you still remain faithful. And every now and again, you're tempted to ask the question, where's God? But, but you get through that and you still remain faithful. And do you know who is watching you through all of that? No. And do you know how your faithfulness is affecting all the people around you? No. And do you know who is a day or a month or a year or five years from giving their life to Christ because of something that you did? No. This is a lifetime reduced to a day. And so the nobleman is stunned. He, he doesn't know what to think because in his mind he had two options. Either Jesus comes with me and my son lives or Jesus doesn't come with me and he dies. And, and Jesus is like, well, there's a third option. I'm not coming with you and your son's going to live. So, so, don't, so go home and, and don't worry and don't hurry. Everything will be fine. The nobleman is not getting what he asked for and he's not getting who he came for. And so the nobleman makes a decision. And it's a, it's a decision that people have been making ever since. And I'm not exaggerating. It's a decision that can change the trajectory of a life. Perhaps it could change the trajectory of your life. He decided to trust Jesus and to act out in his life that trust. He decided to do to act as if what Jesus said was true based on not what he had seen, but on what other people had seen and heard. And the text continues. It says, the man took Jesus at his word and departed. He walked away from the only person that he thought could save his son. He behaved as if the things that Jesus said was true. Could you imagine? Some of you can, because, because you've, did, you've been doing this your whole life. And to, to use a phrase that many Christians would use, he walked home by faith and not by sight. He walked home by faith and not by sight. And we continue reading. It says, while he was still on his way, his servants met him with the news that his boy was living. And they didn't come halfway down this journey just to give him an uptake to say that he's still alive. They came, because he, they came to tell him he was better. And he says, when he inquired as to the time when his son got better, they said to him, yesterday at one in the afternoon, the fever left him. And I can imagine tears welling up in the father's eyes as he looks back at Cana. Because the text tells us, it says, then the father realized that this was the exact time when Jesus had said to him, your son will live. So he goes home, he tells his family, and he says, so he and his whole household believed. And you would too. Because seeing is believing. So let's go back to that phrase for just a moment. Walking by faith. If you grew up in church like I did, you've heard that phrase a lot walking by faith. But here's what they didn't tell you. Walking by faith is not walking by hope. And walking by faith is not walking by wishful thinking. Here's what walking by faith is, and we just saw it demonstrated. Walking by faith is living every single day of your life as if Jesus is who Jesus said that he was. Walking by faith is living every single day of your life as if the things that Jesus said is true. Walking by faith is living your life as if your sin is truly forgiven. 
and that God's not going to hold that against you and that you don't have to confess it over and over and over and over again and that God, you don't have to pay God back because God's not looking to be paid back because that's what Jesus taught and that's what Jesus illustrated and that was the significance of Jesus' death at the end of the Gospel of John. Walking by faith And this is the hardest part for some of you. Walking by faith is living every single day of your life as if you truly are loved. Unconditionally. And not because of something that you did. And walking by faith is trying to pour that same love out to everybody that you encounter. Because that's what changed the world. Christianity did not change the world because everybody got what they prayed for. Christianity did not shape Western culture because everybody got what they asked for or what they wanted. Christianity shaped Western culture because of a unique brand of love. And if you are a follower of Jesus, you are part of this brand and it's, as I have loved you love. Before Jesus left the earth, He told his disciples, he said, by this, by this, people will know that I am who I said that I am. And and people will know that you are my followers by the way that you treat each other. So go and love, love as I have loved you. That is what changed the world. That is what changes a city. That is what changes marriages. That's what shapes culture. You're walking by faith. You living your life as if Jesus is who he says he is, is what causes other people to stop and to wonder. And it has been since the very beginning. At the end of John's account, after Jesus has been crucified and he's been resurrected, Jesus and his disciples are all gathered together. And Jesus knows that the only reason, the only reason that they have returned to their faith is because of the stuff that they had seen. He knows that, that, that the only reason they're standing there right now is because they watched him hang on a cross and they watched him die and they watched him put into a tomb And then they went and found the tomb empty and now they're standing there talking to Jesus. He knows that's the only reason they believe. Jesus knows that seeing is believing. And he also knows that these men are going to go on to share their testimony, to write down the things that they saw and the things that they heard and the things that they experienced with Jesus and that this would be the way that Christianity would spread throughout the world. And so Jesus says something to them in this moment that's really for you and me. Jesus looks at him and he says, because you have seen me, because I'm standing here right now in front of you, because you watched me die on a cross and you watched me buried and now we're having a conversation, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Your belief and your faith are not things that you just pull out of thin air. Our belief is based in the testimony of the people that walked with Jesus and on the things that they had seen and the things that they heard. And for those of you who believe, those of you that are Jesus followers, you now have a job to do. And your job is to expose as many people as you possibly can to the same testimony that brought you to your belief and is the reason that you walk by faith. In two weeks, we're going to celebrate Easter. We're going to be celebrating what we believe about Jesus, that he came down to this earth, that he lived a perfect, sinless life that he died on the cross as a sacrifice for the world to save it, and that he rose again, confirming exactly who he said he was. 
And you have the opportunity to bring as many people as you possibly can to hear that same testimony. So that through hearing, they may believe. And that through believing, they may have eternal life. 